you know, part of the, the biggest problem also is that people with my affliction, it feels like everybody has a problem with you, but you're the only one who doesn't know it. ADHD Rewired, episode 395. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. And you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Nicholas Hunsaker. Nicholas was first uh, originally from Switzerland. He's a longtime motoring enthusiast, licensed racer, and fourth generation painter. He now lives and works in the U.S. as a professional automotive fine artist. He trained at Pasadena's Art Center College of Design and incorporates many elements of art deco, advertising posters in his paintings, a style he calls, quote-unquote, period correct. He's worked with the likes of Porsche, uh, 24H Le Mans. I have no idea who that is. If you're a car person, I'm guessing you do, but I don't know. McLaren, I've heard of that. That's a, that's a, that's a fancy sports car, right? Yes. And Ford, we've all heard of those. Ford, yes. Um, to create a one-of-a-kind uh, art pieces and automotive-themed design prints for apparel and products. There's a whole bunch more to this, uh, this, this your, your bio here, and I'm going to let, uh, let's kind of unfold it in this conversation. So, Nicholas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I, I just, I'm sorry to do this, but... Uh... I'm an ADHD brain, as you know, so I'm okay. I'm allowed to correct you right off the bat. <laughs> Pronunciation. What? Okay, what it's just, I'm going to be skewered by my uh, audience. It's Porsche. Porsche. You Porsche. Know, not a porch. Yes, it's Porsche. Porsche. And what did I say? I said for- Porsche. Porsche. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's Porsche. It's 24 hours of Le Mans, which is the oldest and most famous race in the world. Okay. Um, you got McLaren and you got Ford. I, I, I could have added about a hundred more uh, international sounding names, but. <laughs> okay. So I know this is going to be going to two different audiences. One is right. the ADHD Rewired audience and the other as your audience. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I know that you recently had a, uh, uh, you know, I think you said a big painting that is in the head, uh, like the front of the headquarters of Porsche. Oh, yes. <laughs> Porsche, that's good. Uh, actually, this was, oh my God, now it's, that was 2015. Um, I was commissioned to do a 20 foot painting that went into headquarters of Porsche Cars North America and it's in their lobby in Atlanta. Um, so, yes, I mean, those are, that would be an example of a, of a corporate client. And I obviously have um, lots of uh, private clients as well. So, it's a mixture of, uh, corporations like the ones you've mentioned and private individuals who collect cars and obviously um the company that we have uh that uh that what well, my wife started around my artwork uh we have lots of clients there too and that's a little bit of a different field because you know it's kind of a two-pronged approach on the one hand we have the artwork which consists of original paintings and prints posters and on the other side we have the uh, kind of what we call the design company which has t-shirts shoes jackets hats coffee mugs you know uh whatever I- iphone covers and uh, mouse mats um you know lanyards. merchandise merchandise yeah it's kind of like the gift shop you know Okay, so normally I would uh, I would ask for you to share like your your website at the very end of this episode. I think it would be uh, you know, trying to just imagine my my listeners who may be interested in kind of what you are doing while listening. What's sure? What, um, where where can they kind of see some of your work? Well, if you just Google my last name, so it's H U N Z is in zebra I K E R. Um, um, 
I'll show up or you can also put in art or cars or Porsche or something, or you just go to my website or our website, which is uh, just my first and last name. So it's Nicholas, N-I-C-O-L-A-S. H U N Z I K E R dot com. And you'll find everything there. Yeah. If you open up the podcast app right now and just kind of tap on it to see the show notes, um, we'll get that link there too. So you can take, take a look at uh, his stuff while we're, we're having this conversation. So you love creating artwork. Um, yes, I think so. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a fourth generation fine artist. So uh, my, you know, my father was, I mean, by trade, he was a classical musician, but he, he sculpts and he paints, obviously sketches. And my, and then so my grandfather, my, my father's side, he was a, um, he was a painter. He was an illustrator for a shoe company called Bali. You may have heard of it, B-A-L-L-Y. And they would do those art deco posters, you know, with a girl standing on top of a mountain or a girl tying her shoelaces. Um, and then his twin brother, so that'd be my grand uncle on my father's side. He was also um, a painter, um, illustrator. He, um, they both studied in France in the 1920s in Paris. Um, so they kind of went through the whole, um, you know, post modernism and post modernism or at the time modernism craze. And then their father, he was a classically trained, uh, painter. So in those days it was almost, you know, pre-photography. So you would get commissioned to do, a, um, a portrait of someone or a landscape mm. of, of something of some kind. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of the trade of our family on my father's side. Okay, so I'm really interested in something. So I just asked you um, if you that you love painting because you 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 oh, were right, telling yeah. me so you were telling me <laughs> that you can literally go into hyper focus for like eight hours straight and not realize time has passed. Right. So my assumption was you love I mean, painting, but the way you yeah. answer that, you're like, I think so. And then you started talking about your family history of well, artists. You know what? In the, <laughs> I <laughs> I think you know it's weird because a lot of people ask me now, like, how do I become a painter? How do I become a painter? And to be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> I think uh, what I do know is that it's pretty much, it's almost, I became, I'm doing it by default because it's, it's probably the only thing I, I'm capable of doing or able, where I'm able to make a living, you know, um, because I've, after school, I, I did go into corporate America. I worked at an ad agency where I wrote and directed TV commercials. Yeah, I did that for about five years and I was, I think, three or four different agencies. And I was always at the cusp of, of getting fired or um, not fired, but, you know, it was always kind of, it was just a struggle for me to adhere to uh, arbitrary rules like dress codes and showing up on time. And, you know, just the, <laughs> the, the typical stuff that we... we all those finicky things that all right, those employers right. want us to do. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was put on probation for swearing or, you know, just little things that after a while... Um, kind of become a hindrance because they tend to put adults in charge. Um, and so, you know, I, and it's really weird because now that I look back on it, if you had asked me what my goal is at the ad agency, my answer was at the time, my mindset was how much nonsense can I get away with because of my talent? You know, like how many excuses are I going to make for you? Oh, okay. So, like so you which is why if, you know, if someone said the clients, you know, they're because we had clients like Toyota or Procter and Gamble and, you know, Fortune 500 companies. So if you go to their headquarters or you have a presentation, they ask that you wear something that's, um, you know, the corporate costume kind of. Yeah. And then so if you wear the, the warm up jersey for the Yankee uniform for batting practice, um, they tend not to understand that. And to my mind, it's well, if I wear it and don't get fired, that must mean they might like me a lot or I'm really good at my job. <laughs> You know, so that's kind of what it deteriorated into. So, yeah, long answer short, I think part of you, you asked me, I like to paint a lot. I think, um, yeah, to some extent I do, but I really think um, it's kind of the only thing I can do, really, you know, to, to kind of have a, a normal life. And So is there part of you that while you like it, you wish there was other stuff? Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's racing, but, you know, the, the, something that struck me like um my my wife just told me this earlier that um when because she when she met me i wasn't painting yet full time i was okay. just i mean just i was i was working at an agency as a as a as an art director or creative director and um she said when you started painting there was a different focus like because i i remember we moved into this house and we had you know blank walls everywhere so i said oh you know what i'm gonna paint for four paintings because i couldn't find stuff i liked so I just painted four paintings uh, with Porsches in them. And she said, you know, the focus you had, you displayed when you did those four, it was just, 
you know, you had to be told you must eat now and, you know, it's time to go to bed. It was just different from, from anything else. And, and she so had never seen that. She hadn't that seen that before. And, and it's true. I mean, my, my hyper focus is extreme. Um, I mean, there was this one anecdote I told you in the uh, earlier when, because nowadays I film a lot of my painting. So I, I, I needed a, a two minute clip of me painting and I, I had a stopwatch on my wrist and I hit record and I painted for what I thought was two minutes. And I went over by what I thought was 28 seconds. So I thought, okay, fine. I have two minutes and 28 seconds. Turned out I was painting for 28 minutes. And, and I'm sure a lot of people with hyperfocus can relate to this where, you know, they just completely get lost. And you know, I, since I know you said that you are, you're planning on sharing this with your uh, audience, for your audience who maybe doesn't fully know what ADHD is and they think that, um, oh, ADHD, you can't focus. Right. And like, that's like not what it is. Right. I mean, I, th- I mean, as you know, it's probably the worst named disorder in the world because it, it, it's not so much that you can't. It's not great. No, it's not so much. I mean, <laughs> either one of them, you know, they, they went from ADD to ADHD and they didn't really improve anything. <laughs> right. It's like you can have ADHD without the H, but it's still ADHD. Right. Right. Um, so the problem is, you know, the problem is not so much that we can't focus because it's always a lot of times people think of it as a kid's disease. And, it, you know, it's the one kid that's running, that's bouncing off the walls. Right. Well, it's an issue of how we regulate our attention. So yes, on one extreme, there is the maybe bouncing off the walls, doing a thousand different things, you know, oh, look, squirrel, right? Right. And the other extreme is what we refer to as hyper-focus. Right. So, and I think you really described that well. It's in, and it is interesting because there is a, I think this is overlap, but there is some distinct uh, separate components between uh, hyper-focus and flow. Okay. Right. Or I think that in, in flow, you, you do in, similar to hyperfocus where you kind of lose track of time where you try to lose yourself into in what you're doing. Right. But I think where in hyperfocus, we may be cognizantly aware that we're locked in, but like we can't unlock. Right. That's, that sounds very meta. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know, to be honest, I, 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 I Obviously, I'll take your word for it, but um, how do you experience it? Um, I mean, you know, it's weird because it sounds weird because obviously, you know, painting, I started it because I wanted to because I wanted something for myself and I like doing it. Mm-hmm. But now, obviously, it's become a job because that's what I do. So I don't really ask myself too many more questions of how I feel or what I experience, because a lot of times, um, I mean, you know, to be honest. It's hard to say because, you know, lots of it also has to do uh, with the end result in terms of what the, what the result is, right? So you're looking, f- I'm, I'm trying to find out if this is going to work or not, or what's it going to look like when it's done? And I'm looking forward to that um, um, end result, and which is the painting in my case. Okay. So, and, and I noticed in the past, I was very focused on finishing a painting so I could, you know, I'd be finished and it looks good to however I wanted it. And nowadays, actually, you're right, because I do enjoy the process. Just the fact that I'm doing that, that is my job. I think that to me is part of the pleasure that I don't have to go to office. To, I don't have a dress code. Nice. Um, you know, I, I am in my studio and, you know, there are days when I go into the studio and I know, OK, all I have to do today is is paint. So I think to me, that's kind of the reward now because, you know, because the paintings themselves, yeah, that's the product. But afterwards you know they i sell them and they go all over the world i mean they're literally on every continent except antarctica um that's the only continent where they're not on so some of them you know you paint them out you spend i don't know a month sometimes or a week and then you never see them again but that's okay i mean you know that's that's what a painter does right you you paint things and then you sell them and then they leave so sorry my answers are very long (laughs) This is an eighty issue podcast, you know, whether or not right, you actually okay. answer the questions, you know, it's, it's all right. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, like many people picked up a, a COVID hobby that was very short lived and that was painting. I painted three, I painted three paintings. Right. Um, was it just me or do you think more, like, do you think painters with ADHD have to buy more brushes because they don't clean them off fast enough? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Is it because when you, you just leave, you forget to clean them? Well, it's either I forget to clean them or I'll, I'll put them in a cup of water. And then it's like, I'll come back to that room a week later to see the water's evaporated. Oh, okay, like, okay. Oh. 
Right. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's weird because I, I think I'm okay with my brush. I mean, I go through brushes just because I use them up yeah. so much, but I tend to be okay with, with cleaning them because... Um, well, you know, because uh, especially the type of painting I, I do, I, I deal in absolute colors. So if, okay. if if I use blue, it's blue. And if I use red, it's red. I don't mix. I don't mix my colors on the canvas. Got it. So um, and and also part partially also because of, of th- th- my subject matter, because okay. certain cars, um, you know, they were painted in a certain color in terms of their livery or, um, you know, it's obviously sponsorship that comes into it, you know, or or his- historically, you know, if it's. Uh, certain car companies are associated with certain colors. So I tend to, I tend to have to get those right for my audience. And mm-hmm. I do too. So I guess, again, long answer to, um, to answer your question. I don't have a problem cleaning my brushes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was too great. Well, I guess I was just sort of like curious as to like what, how ADHD sort of shows up in a domain right. for you that, that you right. really like. What I want to do first is I want to take a quick break. And then uh, when we come back, I want to uh, I kind of keep diving in to all of the things around art and your ADHD and uh, kind of how, how you, you basically learn to use hyperfocus as a, an asset for you and your business. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our award winning online video based coaching and accountability groups. I want to once again congratulate all the members of ARC 25. We look forward to seeing you in the alumni community. We are so excited for our upcoming fall season. That's right, our 26th season of coaching and accountability groups are now full, but that doesn't mean it's too early to start planning ahead for 2022. Get your name added to our winter season interest list by going to coachingrewired.com and clicking on the big periwinkle bluish looking button that says click here to add your name to our winter coaching interest list and make sure to confirm your email so you get notified when we start registration and check your spam and junk folders too just in case it ended up there and make sure to allow emails from us to go to your inbox thank you again to everyone who attended our registration events I said we are full for our fall season we look forward to seeing all of you on october 6th did you miss signing up but really want to join us for our winter season we've started a new interest list learn more by going to coachingrewired.com our coaching and accountability groups are more than just about learning skills to help manage our adhd it's about community connection and finding people who really do understand what it's like to live with adhd with our alumni membership community this is the community that will be there for you even after you finished your season of coaching groups. Learn more about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups and get your name added to our winter group interest list and be the first to find out when we'll be hosting our registration kickoff event by going to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. And to all the new members of the upcoming 26th season, we'll see you soon. And for everyone else, that's coachingrewired.com. Support for this podcast comes from ADHD Rewild. Support for this podcast comes from ADHD Rewired's virtual co-working community, Adult Study Hall. Grab your to-do list and join the ADHD-friendly co-working community built just for us. Jump in and come work with me on whatever that is I'm putting off. Whether it's a cover letter you've been meaning to write, replying to a batch of emails you've been avoiding, mapping out the next steps for a project you finally want to get started on, or finally getting to work on that slide deck for the ADHD conference you're presenting at in November that you technically were supposed to submit back in August. And by you, I mean me. Our adult study hall drop-in room is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's why we call it ASH 24-7. Or join one of our ASH Plus sessions and one of our facilitators will guide you along the way. This week, I'm hosting an Ask Plus session on Wednesday and Friday from 12 to 2 Central as I am trying to finish my presentation for the upcoming virtual ADHD conference. Oh, and if you want to attend this year's international conference on ADHD, it is going to be virtual again. 
and I was able to get ADHD Rewired listeners a pretty sweet 25% off discount. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash ADHDcon and it will be redirected to that discount code automatically applied on the registration page. Come work with us in Adele Study Hall or if you need verbal check-ins to keep you going, you can also join us for our Ash Plus sessions where you get to check in on your progress. We have sessions covering anything from cleaning and decluttering, task buster sessions for your most regular tasks, job search and career focus sessions, exercise sessions, and more. You can see all of our Ash Plus sessions by going to adultstudyhall.com. And if you're already a member of the Adult Study Hall community, keep an eye out for more Ash Plus sessions coming soon. Your membership to Adult Study Hall will give you access to all of our current and upcoming Ash Plus sessions and Ash 24-7. And it's all for only $19.99 a month. It's free for the first week. So join us and give it a try by going to adultstudyhall.com. Get motivated and join other ADHD brains just like you to start crossing off your to-dos and work with other adults. Just get it. Website again is adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. Join us. All right, we are back. So I'm not a painter. I'm not a visual artist, um, but I'm a creator and I'm a musician. And I think about, you know, while there's certain aspects to, I think, my ADHD that kind of help me in my music. Right, right. I think there are also lots of aspects to it where it's a hindrance to, like, my ability to actually, like, write and play a song the same way more than once. Right. <laughs> like, I can't do it, but I can improvise really easily. And what are the things as an artist for you? Where, where, as I know, because you're still, you know, still relatively new to right. ADHD, and I know you're still kind of right, learning right, about right. all the aspects and facets of ADHD. Yes. But from what you're learning so far, how do you see ADHD showing up in uh, in your work? First, in a in a way that challenges your work. Um, it, I mean, I have to say this element has gotten better since I'm on medication. I've seen, and and since I'm doing um, therapy you know, just education in general and, pra- and trying to practice mindfulness. Mm. Um, but so my answer to that would be, I was somewhat disorganized in terms of where things were. So I would spend a lot of time looking for the paintbrush that I just had in my hand or those kinds of things. And, you know, I mean, I've done, I don't know how many paintings I've done. It's got to be in the hundreds. I should know, but I don't know. But each painting has a project number. And then for each painting, I have um, airtight containers and they have a, um, a label on them. I have an old, old school label maker, you know, with the, with the tape. And uh, it has the project number of each painting on the, on the painting, uh, I mean, on the container so I can find my paints. Because there's, you know, a lot of times I work on more than one painting. So I have to stay organized. So I think that is one example of where it's a hindrance and obviously just in the world of business um the impulse control in general is is probably my my biggest um what do you want to call it my biggest regrets you know just Mm. in terms of um, not being able to say no or just jumping into things foolheartedly um or or just working on too many projects at the same time Mm. and then uh, unfortunately, you know, my, my wife is, is, is part of the business and, you know, she's, she's the business manager. So uh, it falls on her to clean up the messes sometimes. And that's, that's obviously not a fun thing for her to do. And also since, um, you know, I'm the instigator, but then sometimes something else grabs your attention and you move on, but then the project is still on the books or still, you know, you still have to maintain it. So, you know, that's very difficult for her, obviously. And that's a, a big drawback. Um, and I think that's part of, of um, I mean, it just cre- creates a lot of stresses, you know, because we work together and we live together. And um, yeah, so I think I think those two, those two right there are, are pretty, um, I think, big, big things that I have to watch. What, what's harder for you, starting or, or finishing? Um, well, obviously, I guess for most people, it'd be, I mean, for, for for people like us, I guess it would be finishing, right? Because we start 22 things at the same time. Um, so you're commissioned to do a piece of work? Yeah, like, I mean, usually... No, no problem I, starting? No, because usually I have a, uh, you know, usually you have a timeline attached to it. And, you know, and and some and also, you know, the way you get paid is if you get a deposit, you get the second check when it's over. So, you, you know, that can help as a motivator sometimes too. Okay. So do you wrestle at all with any perfectionism? 
Um, no, so, not really. I mean, sometimes in the sketching phase, because I, I tend to sketch out. So by the time I start painting, I kind of know what I'm going to do, or maybe more so than other artists. Um, so, and I've kind of, you know, I learned this in advertising also, or we re restoring cars. It's, you know, the first 95% um, go pretty quickly, but the, the last 5% take just as, you know, take the same amount it of is, time again. Yes. Um, yes. The, the almost done doesn't actually mean you're almost done. <laughs> right. And so, and, you know, when I was at art center, um, we had an instructor and he used to, he, he, he had a saying, he always asked, you know, when car designers know when the design is finished and the answer is whenever the bean counters tell them to put the pencil down. So, <laughs> and meaning that if, if it were up to us, we'd never finish anything. Right. So at mm. some point it's just gotta be, it's gotta go right. It's good enough. And that's something. So do you think it would be harder for you if you were literally just painting for yourself and doing your own shows versus um, like being commissioned? No, I don't think so. Because at some point, you know, because when you when you're dealing with paintings, or, I think but probably with music as well. But there comes a point where if you keep working on it, you make it worse, you know. <laughs> and so you just ha you have to know when to stop. And so sometimes obviously you stop, you know, a little bit too soon and sometimes a little bit too late. But. So, I, I, but I think with experience, you kind of get to the point where you go, no, you know, now we're done. And to me, as once I sign something, then it's over, you know, we're done. When you, when you're painting, um, how long do you actually, are, are you focused on a painting for before you sort of come up for air? Like on the, any given day or? Yeah, like on a, on a typical, maybe a typical day. Um, well, it depends a lot because, um, again, you know, I mean, some paintings might take a week to do, some might take two, two days, three days, and some paintings might take a month to finish. Okay. So, uh, on, you know, I, I could be painting uh, the whole day, I could be painting half the day, and, and a lot of times, you know, we, ha we have, um, we, we also have the company to work with. So, there's lots of, you know, there's emails and phone calls and design work. Ah, the, 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 the business side. Right, the business side, which right. we all know that um, that's the executive function uh, skills that uh, aren't working so well. And that's, that's harder for you. Right, for sure. So, um, so my question though, like, would you say when you're painting, like, what would be the minimum amount of time? Are you typically going at least like three or four hours if you're going to paint? Oh, um, yeah, it could be. I mean, again, you know, maybe it's just, maybe sometimes, again, I hate to give you these wishy-washy answers, but, you know, sometimes I work on more than one painting at a time. So okay. it might be, I just have to finish up this background. So it could be just 20 minutes on this painting and then I might be an hour on something else. Or, well, do you have like multiple canvases sort of set up so you can sort of like yes, do like a like wrong robin of, the of yeah, attention? So when like... something is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when something <laughs> is drying, I tend to work on something else. So I don't have too much downtime. Or sometimes I might work on a car when paint is drying. You know? So let me ask you this though. So, um, and, and this is kind of about hyper-focus. Right. You know, a lot of people will say that hyper-focus is like their, their ADHD superpower. Right. Right. And I say that hyper-focus has a, it's a dark side to hyper-focus. Right. And often when we get into hyper-focus on something, we are actually, for most people, will be draining their sort of executive function, sort of resources at a faster rate and also it makes it harder and takes longer to sort of replenish that executive re resource. Okay. So the car analogy, it's kind of like going to, uh, going to the store, there's 10 lights, you are flooring it at every light right, when right. it turns green. You, you may get the job done more quickly overall, but you are actually like pushing your engine harder and you're going to run out of gas right. quickly. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, to be honest, the only I don't have that with the hyper focus in so much in terms of uh, time being spent. I experience it more um, kind of an emotional. Um, I, I don't want to want to call it. You're kind of emotionally tired afterwards. Okay. And and not so much from the painting. It's more from um, like sketching. Um, just because to me that seems more like problem solving. Mm. Um. So and so when because a lot of times uh, when I sketch. You know, I'm trying to solve a problem, obviously. And so there's lots of research involved. And some, you know, sometimes I do a sketch. It could take me weeks or months to figure out all the details and make sure everything is accurate. Because, you know, I am concerned about historical accuracy. Because in many ways, art is kind of a window or a mirror to society. So you, in my particular case, I want to, to uh, you know, capture a moment in time, so to speak. 
And so I want to get all the details right. So if, I would imagine you know, people who are really into cars, like they're, right. they're going to be very but critical to, of like, if for you get sure, something wrong. For sure. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the basic level, right? You want to get the right car, the right colors and the right numbers and all that. But then, you know, I've done paintings, like I finished one that's, uh, what are we, six, five, it's about 20 feet wide. And so oh, wow. there's a plane in there. There's a helicopter in there. There are people who are native to, uh, to, to Central Africa. There are camels in there, you know. So I go to the extent of, okay, I need to get the plane that actually existed. I need to get the tail number right. Um, you know, so it's a DC three and it used to be a, a Dakota that, that, you know, so I, it goes way back. And then if I, you know, depict these, um, native people in, in central Africa, I want to make sure that if I put a, a, a dress on them, that the pattern on the dress is actually part of their heritage, you know, cause I don't want to just go, Oh, well that looks like, you know, that, that feels kind of disingenuous. That, that seemed like that would work. It's like, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, kind of, I mean, nowadays they call it cultural appropriation. Right. Where, right. That's where I guess the, would you, would you say the, the, the perfectionism comes in, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm really afraid to, to depict something that just isn't accurate from that point of view that, that really bothers me. But I imagine that like you're getting probably paid pretty handsomely for, for these. Right. No, but I mean, in, just in terms of, of the effort that goes in, mm -hmm. um, regardless of if I do it for myself or if, if I get paid for it, I still want to get everything right. And so, you know, solving those problems and getting the right angles, you know, just for everything to, to look cohesive to me, sometimes that takes out a lot of emotion. And so when I'm done with it, um, I'm kind of relieved, but then I'm also a little bit depressed. It's almost like after race day, you know, you kind of have your, um, after a race, you feel like your, you know, your brain, your brain, you know, like, uh, uh, you manufactured all these, um, endorphins and, 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 uh, the dopamine crush dopamine. of like, yeah. The thing and you've been looking you forward to is now down. over yeah. and now it's like, right. Oh, now, what? now it's over, you know? And so I feel kind of like depleted from that point. There's, of view, but not there's so nothing much from, I'm looking forward to anymore. Right. 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 Yeah. Everything sucks. <laughs> and you know, um, how, how many hours do you think you spend doing this sort of research, making sure you're, you're getting it right? Um, like on, on any given painting. Yeah. Um, I could literally be from, one sketch could take me anywhere from weeks. So we're talking maybe, okay, I did one the other day. I counted. It was about a hundred hours. Okay. Now you don't have to tell me what you make, but could you figure out what your what you make an hour based on your average, uh, the commissions you make? Right. And, uh, um, you know, I've never done the math. I'm awful at math. So. Well, okay. So, <laughs> so you can sort of figure that out. Yeah. Right. So my question is, would it actually make more sense for you? Because a lot of people could do research. Right. Yeah. Not a lot of people can do this, the painting. Right. My wife always says this, like, why don't you get some of these people to help you with this? There's people who would love to do this, you know. And on one hand, yes. But then sometimes I'm looking for something so specific. So for me to explain to them what I'm looking for might take so much time that by the time I would, let's say I say I need an image of this particular plane from 1985 that landed in, you know, in, in Niger, in the middle of the desert. And it has to be a plane that was, that actually existed and that was still airworthy at the time. So I might get back 200 plane pictures. So now I have to go through 200 plane pictures, you know, so sometimes that also creates more work, but I, I know exactly what you're saying, but you know, to be honest, um, yeah, I, I guess I could, I, I just haven't really, I haven't really considered it to be honest. And I guess I consider it part of my job. You know, I don't know, but I hear well, you. And, you know, gathering the information and getting the accuracy of stuff. Like, I, I think that's, and the sort of the idea of, oh, you just, you know, just hire someone. Like, it right. sounds really easy until you realize that that actually requires really effective communication. Right. Because then, then that's where the, the breakdown occurs again. You know? But it's also an opportunity to kind of grow in some, some areas, right? Like right. Right. Um, no, you're right. So, yeah. Cause it's, if you think about like, there was this really good exercise in the, Oh, what was the book? It was um, Virtual Freedom. It's about like working with, with virtual teams. And he has this exercise in there where he asks like, what can't you do? What do you not like to do? And then what are you currently doing that probably somebody else should be doing? Right. And so looking at each of those things. And the thing that's hard is the things that we probably shouldn't be doing. Right. But we enjoy doing it. Yeah. And then we really have to like say, like, well, what are the trade-offs? Like if, if I can get back 
say, you know, a couple hundred hours, say in a year of research, right. I could be spending that couple hundred hours painting and actually bringing in more money or I could be right, spending a couple right. hundred hours relaxing, right? right? Like, I, I hear what you're saying. I think um, I would hire some, I would have to hire someone to be able to explain to you why it's not a good idea to hire someone. <laughs> Um, because partially, you know, like for instance, like the, 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 the problems I'm trying to solve sometimes, like, like the, the one I said, I spent a hundred hours mm-hmm. on, for instance, part of it also had to do with perspective and proportion. Okay. So I have, I have four different cars or it could be four different shapes. And I, you know, on like, let's say on the blueprint, you know what they look like. They're all slightly different in person. If you stand in front of them, they're all going to be slightly different in proportion to one another. As, I don't know if you're into photography or not, but depending on what kind of lens you use to photograph an object, it mm-hmm. distorts everything, right? So if a long lens tends to uh, foreshorten everything and wider lens lenses tend to make everything kind of bulbous and kind of like a fisheye, what people call, you know, wide angle. Mm-hmm. So depending on what kind of a lens the photographer used to shoot a, a particular object, I would have to be able to train someone to recognize which yeah. lens that person used to shoot that car from which angle from which distance so i can compare one to one because i need to know the relationship in terms of you know what i mean so now we're getting into a whole thing so by the time i explain this to someone and they come back with 100 pictures and then i have to weed out the ones where they used the wrong angle and they weren't standing in the right place and the light is coming from the wrong direction you know it's just <laughs> well you you went to, to art school right yes so i imagine you get tons of critical feedback when you're a student, yes right yes. Can you take that same approach? What do you mean? Oh, like, so I'm teaching someone else to mm-hmm. do this now? <laughs> like an apprenticeship. Um, yeah, you know what? Actually, that is some, again, these are all things that have been told to me by my wife, by other people <laughs> about, you know, oh, you should go back to, to Art Center and maybe do an imprint, uh, uh, like, you know, like an, an internship or something, you know, where you teach someone these things. And as you know, um, it just doesn't stick, you know? Yeah. It sounds like you've like figured out what you actually do well and you really want to kind of just stick in that lane. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I've, I've had lots of issues with focusing on, on not spending on t- my time on things I shouldn't be spending their time on, you know, and that's kind of what my wife, um, obviously she, she keeps me in check, but also that's kind of part of her fear, you know, when all of a sudden I disappear down a rabbit hole where, you know, like when in, in our, in my studio, in the front room, I put in, I'm putting in a metal shop. So there's a lathe and the drill press and, you know, and I, I built some equipment for it and which I shouldn't have done, but I did, um, you know, and I'm, and I, I'm welding and all this stuff. And so at some point I, I kind of fell down this rabbit hole of, of drill, drill presses from the 1940s. And then, you know, before you know it, I'm ordering, you know, I'm looking at schematics of, of drill presses from 1945 and old PDF Sears catalogs and looking up part numbers and ordering tiny little washers for 59 cents on eBay. So I can, you know, and then my wife is like, oh, my God, you cannot fall down this rabbit hole of, <laughs> you know, and, and she's right. And, and I think that's kind of what, unfortunately, I think that's to me is kind of the biggest issue is that you, we do tend to. It's almost, you know, like a dog follows its nose. Yeah. And you just kind of go, oh, this, you know, wait, how does this work? You know? And then before you know it, you just spent four hours looking for a washer for. <laughs> well, the, the, the first steps of getting out of that rabbit hole is you got to stop digging. Right, right, right. <laughs> All um, right. Let's, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'd like to hear a little bit more about kind of how you came to actually get an ADHD diagnosis. Um, I know you were also diagnosed with an auditory processing disorder as well as dyscalculia, which I share all of those things with you. <laughs> so uh, when we uh, will come back, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons who give over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. A special thanks this week to our new patrons, Jens M and Roberta M. Thank you so much for your support. Support for the show starts at any amount with perks for our patrons starting at $5 a month, where you can get ad free episodes of this show right into your favorite podcast player. At $25 a month, you can join me for a group coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month. Our next patron only coaching call is on Tuesday, September 28th at 3 p.m. Central. If you're listening to this on the day it came out, that is today, September 28th, and we're doing it at 3 p.m. Central. That's 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. 
And once you sign up for that tier, don't forget to add these sessions to your calendar. Many of our patrons give simply because they believe in the work we are doing. Support starts at any amount, and I am really so grateful for all of our patrons. Your support has helped us grow our reach. Truly, all of your support is appreciated, and thank you so much for helping us grow and reach people with ADHD everywhere. Join our Patreon community. Perks start at just $5 a month for ad-free episodes. $25 a month gets you a seat at our monthly group coaching call. And for 10 bucks a month, you can get the audio of those coaching calls right in your podcast app. So you can choose one of those amounts or choose any amount that makes sense for you. If you love this show and want to support what we are doing here at ADHD Rewired, head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHD rewire.com slash patreon and if you can't support us financially you can also support us by leaving us a rating and review on apple Podcasts or any podcast app that accepts reviews again thank you so much for all of your support if you like adhd rewired then be sure to check out all of our other shows that we have here on the adhd rewired podcast network There's a little something for everyone. Whether you're new to the show or you've been listening for a while, or you haven't had a chance to check out the other shows on the network, go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast and network to see all of our other podcasts. For tips, strategies, and really satisfying dad jokes in 20 minutes or less, check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. If you are a parent with ADHD or have an ADHD household, ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan is a great resource for parents and educators. For a personal audio journal sharing her ADHD experiences as an Asian Canadian, check out the ADHD Diversified Podcast with MJ Siemens. And if you are a late diagnosed woman who is curious about how hormones affect your ADHD, then check out the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with ADHD Rewired Coach Moira Maven. And it is still in the works because it wouldn't be an ADHD podcast network without a few hiccups and delays here and there. But keep an eye out as Will Herb of Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Rewired Coach Extraordinaire Roxy Martin team up to launch their new show called, wait, what was the question? It's the show where you get to ask your ADHD related questions as Will and Roxy hash out some of their thoughts and share some of their favorite solutions to answer your questions. And did you know that you can meet all of us once a month for our live Q&A that happens every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Central. If you don't want to miss it and want to ask your ADHD-related questions live, then go to ADHDrewired.com slash events to register so you can join us on Zoom. Check out all of our podcasts from Will, Brendan, Moira, MJ, and soon-to-be podcaster Roxy. And we'd love it if you could leave a rating and review for our shows. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes when they are released. A huge thank you from all of us for listening, subscribing, reviewing, and sharing all of our podcasts with the ADHD community. And don't forget, you can join our monthly Q&A. And check out all of our other podcasts all at our website by going to ADHDrewired.com slash events for our live Q&A and ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network to see all of our podcasts. We really are grateful for all of you who listen. Thanks. All right, we are back. All right, Nicholas. So it was, it's only been, what, about two years? Yes, two years ago. Um, I mean, obviously, my wife has dealt with a lot of my ADHD uh, symptoms for the last 15 years, so to speak. Um, and it's been very difficult for her, obviously. And, you know, part of the, the biggest problem also is that people with my affliction, it feels like everybody has a problem with you, but you're the only one who mm-hmm. doesn't know it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like it's almost kind of like drug addicts. You know, it's like you, you think you're fine. It's like, what is everyone's problem? I'm OK. I don't you know. And as it turns out, you're not really fooling anyone and everybody knows. Yeah. But but I'm completely um, just, you know, just uh, unaware mm. of, of, of the damage I inflicted. So two years ago, um, there, there was a woman who, who worked at a company we do business with, and um, she used her position to you know, kind of elicit a, a personal relationship with me. And, and I couldn't see it. And, um, 
you know, it, it was very upsetting to my wife because, um, and I hope she doesn't mind that I say this, but um, she left corporate America when she was in her 20s because she was, you know, harassed approach. Mm. And in her mind, you know, she says, I'm never have to deal with this. And so she made a choice. She hasn't had to deal with it. And here I am and I bring in through the front door, you know, and I'm, I'm not really capable of seeing what's happening. And so to her, she was like, okay, you know, in the past, she's told me, you know, there's sometimes she, she would joke, like there's something wrong with your antenna or, you know, you're not social cues, not really picking up on things. So she would apologize to people. If we met him at events, it's like, oh, you know, it's, he, he, it, it's not that he doesn't like you or don't think of, you know, because he just walked away or he ignores you. It's just, you know, he, it was just kind of stuff to kind of smooth over the wrinkles, so to speak. And, um, but in this case, she really felt like there's got to be something wrong. You know, how, how can you not see for what it is? And so I went to therapy. Um, um, I asked a friend of mine, as it turns out, um, it was a it was a fantastic um, uh, re- reference. Is that is that how you use it? That would that be a reference? Re- referral. Yes. A reference referral. Sorry, um, because this particular doctor, Dr. Sandra Brown, actually specializes in ADHD. She studied she's studied it for I think, I, you know, I shouldn't put words in her mouth, but for decades. Okay. And obviously, you know, she's told me since that she doesn't want to give everyone a, an ADHD diagnosis because she just happens to have studied it. But in my particular case, uh, it was so glaring because it's not that I have a mild case of um, ADHD. I mean, I I mean, just like the very first day I filled out a questionnaire in her office and I put down uh, the wrong street address and a previous street number that didn't match the check that I had given her. And then she asked me, where do you live? And obviously I know where I live, you know, but in that, at the time, I was just running around so quickly, not paying attention to anything that if I filled out a form, I, I would have been liable to put in anything now. And I feel like forms are our version of stairs when you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> pretty, yes, pretty much. I mean, that's, well, just, like, oh God. I mean, sometimes I surprise myself because, you know, I have different handwriting. Oh my God, me too. All of a sudden it's cursive and then I can do block and then, it, and I do my design, you know, like that, the, the, what do you call it? The, the handwriting that the designers use where everything is kind of very calligraphy, you know, over, it's just stylish. Everything looks very fast and you kind of do it. The reason we do it and architects do it too, is because our spelling is awful. So if you make it look cool, like all the E's, you don't use the downstroke and the E, you just do three little, you know, vert, uh, horizontal That's lines. That's when I switched to cursive and I don't know how to spell <laughs> the words. <laughs> right, right. So then I looked down on my form and I started in cursive and then it's, you know, it's, it's architect uh, handwriting and then it's mine. And so... Yeah, so filling out forms is, is that's our kryptonite. Oh my but gosh. once uh, my wife Heather's, you know, she says, "Okay, you've you've got to go. There's something wrong." And obviously, there was. I mean, I, I shouldn't say wrong, but there was something abnormal. Is that okay to say? Or 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 you know, yeah, yeah, it's right. there's there been was, different. There was something we, we had like, proof yes. that was different. And then, um, and then the research phase took a long time for me. You know, a good yeah. I mean, I'm still learning, obviously. Um, just to how wide. Um, how the scope of of all the nonsense I've put her through, and some of it I just come to realize now. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, I think the other challenge is you know for her, which is you know it kind of sucks. Oh, shouldn't say that word, but oh, it's fine. It's okay. Um, it's it's kind of unfortunate that it's it's my disorder, but I and I've put her through so much, but now she has to go out of her way. To, you know, A, make accommodations, which isn't really fair. And B, you know, she now has to learn about it as well. Um, and, and that's, you know, that kind of where the guilt sound comes in sometimes, you know, where you just feel. I mean, obviously, my life, you know, we all suffered from it, from from all the, you know, all the jackets you lost and the shoes you left behind and you've forgotten your keys and you don't know where that is. And, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and obviously, but you know, when you're hurting other people, it becomes more real because then. Oh yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Like when, when, when something that you didn't mean to do, but is a function right. of like your ADHD, when it ha- does have a negative impact on someone else, that's hard for sure. And then the worst part is, is that they tell you they're hurting and you can't hear them or you're 
you know, in my case, I'm very defensive, obviously, because yeah. anytime anyone walks up to me to say hello, it's, you know, I didn't do it. <laughs> was, uh, did you grow up thinking that uh, Nicholas was a synonym for don't stop and cut it out? Um, no, not really. No, okay. It, it's, it's no, not really. <laughs> I know you meant it as a joke, but no, not really. I think to me, it's literally... I mean, I made the discovery, like I used to be, a, when I was in that, uh, at the agency, you know, this was 15 years, I mean, whatever, 20 years ago, I guess. Um, I, I saw two people talking in the hallway and I took the long way around because I didn't want to walk past them. And I didn't really know why I did it. I just did it. And my CEO at the time says, oh my God, you're so polite. You didn't want to interrupt this. But in my mind, it's, I just didn't want to say hello because th- this is the possibility of having an, an encounter uh, with a person meant there's a possibility that you're being told off mm. for whatever reason, mm. you know, and even to this day, I still do it. I, you know, I leave my studio and I see my, my friend who works two two shops down and sometimes I just duck and get in my car, you know, and I don't even know why I'm doing it, but I think it's the same reaction where you just go like, Oh, I can relate to that in certain scenarios. And for me, it's the like, Oh, I would love to have a one minute conversation with this person. Right. But if we start, there's very little chance it's going to be a right, one minute, right, right. like, hello, yeah. right? It's usually like an hour now. It's like right. now everything's backed up because of that uh, hour. When I, was, when I was working, I used to just walk around with, with paper in my hand. Because if you walk with paper, it, it looks like you're going somewhere. <laughs> so if I went to lunch, I would just take a piece of paper and, you know, like I got to make a copy, you know. So. Now you just got to hold your phone to your <laughs> ear. ear and it, right, you know, right. It's, yeah. Now it's the fake, fake phone. <laughs> um. Now, what about the, uh, the, the auditory processing uh, disorder and dyscalculia? How, how does that affect you? Um, well, I mean, you know, because sometimes, I mean, obviously, that's just kind of dyslexia with numbers, right? So yeah. for me to take down numbers, it's just, I, that would be an SNL skit if I had to take down <laughs> someone's credit card information. <laughs> so relatable, um, yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, the auditory processing, it, it shows up in many ways. But if you spell a word to me and you just give me the letters, I can't write it down. Mm. Like I E it's just, it's, you know, it gets jumbled on the way back out. Yeah. Um, and also just, and I don't know if that's, this is um, like emotional scars, but you know, just trying to recall the conversation mm. and, you know, telling you what was said is very, very di- difficult for me. Or it's just, you, you might get, you get very little, you know, of, of what was actually said. Well, it's interesting that you say that about like emotional scars. Cause I think there's probably like, it's probably two things. I think there's maybe that, like the, the sort of traumas of like, having such challenges doing that you know, over your, your lifespan, but then also the just pure executive function challenge of sequencing the order of events. Right. Like I, like, yeah, I have a hard time. Like, if, if I have a conversation with someone and then I need to like tell someone else like what happened in that conversation, oh, forget it's it. messy. Like right. it's, yeah, it's and, it, and you know, then people say take notes, and so I would. And my wife, every time we had a conference call or in every meeting, she would you know, give me a pad and have a note. And then she would look at me. And every time afterwards, she says, yeah, it lasted about three and a half minutes. And then you were doodling a car or you're that, sketching. Does that help else. you focus? No. no. <laughs> but, <laughs> so even, <laughs> so even, so, you know, it's like take notes, but the note taking, that wasn't any good either because I would come back with a sketch of a, you know. Have you ever tried drawing so, your notes? Like actually like um, drawing conceptual ideas no, around I what's happening in but a it's, meeting? It's funny you mentioned it because uh, there's supposedly um, Leonardo da Vinci would draw out his uh, grocery, his shopping list for his, uh, for, for the person who did the shop, you know, like he uh, draw a load, load, of, load of bread or something. But I don't know if that's because he, because he wrote, he was left-handed. So he wrote right to left. So oh, he wouldn't the ink and he, he wrote mirrored right to left. Um, so obviously nobody would have oh, been wow. able to read. Yeah. Yeah. He taught himself. So, so his notes were mirrored right to left. Whoa. Yeah. That's and something. on top of that, I don't know if most, you know, in, in, in that time period, if most people could read. So even if he had a shopping list that said bread and, and chalk or, uh, yeah, he was, I think he had ADHD too. But. All right. So you're about two years into this, this diagnosis. Yeah. You are working together with your wife. Yeah. Um, Bless her soul. Bless her heart. What are you guys doing in, in terms of just communication and, and sort of addressing any kind of, any of the um, communication challenges? Well, I mean, I think, that's obviously it's the difficult part because, um, you know, I have my triggers um, and, you know, like, I mean, a big one for me is, is, um, is any, I mean, 
The problem is most of the time I have kind of a, an, an adversary uh, attitude in general. So it, it kind of devolves into an argument, even though it isn't, mm. you know, that's a huge one to overcome. And I, I did it today, even with you, I said, no, you're right. And I tend to do that, you know, which is, I'm trying not to do oh, that. Oh, I miss, I, I miss where that, what, when, when was that? Yeah. I, I don't remember, but at some point I said, no, you're right. So, and my therapist points this out to me too. And I, I, I tend to do this, my, but it's just, you know, it's my first reaction is to say, no, no, that can't be right. And then yes, you're right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so, so, but in general, um, it's, I, I mean, it's not easy because I think in general, she's, she's more, um, outgoing. Um, she, she has a, she has lots of empathy. Mm-hmm. Um, I have virtually none which is another side effect of, of our, you know, disorder. Um, and I, I you know, I, I think, you know, it, it, a lot of it has to do with, I mean, it sounds lame, but it has to do with education in a way that I need to find ways to understand um, how she feels and what she goes through and be able to validate her feelings. At the same time, she has to, I mean, has sounds bad, but she has to almost just come to grips and understand what the limitations are. And unfortunately, you know, while we're doing it, we might be committing the mistakes while we're doing them, you know, so we might have a conversation, she might raise her voice, or she might be energetic about something. And I might in turn interpret that as I didn't do that. And at no point did she accuse me of anything. And then she gets mad at me for not, I wouldn't say mad at me, but you know, it's, it's hard for her. I mean, I feel for her because Obviously, the frustration level is is there because she's had to deal with this nonsense for fifteen years, and you know now we're talking more, um, and then every once in a while we both realize, oh my God, we're so far apart, you know. Like I, I, because a lot of times I honestly I just don't understand what she's talking about, you know. Especially, <laughs> and I know that sounds awful, but I honestly I just you know it's as if a lion is talking to me about jazz music. I just don't know. And I think so. That's the that's the difficult part. But it's not sure. that you're not trying that. I think the fact. No, that, no, no. I, I think, think that you're being honest about like. Right, right. I think that's kind of what my therapist keeps saying as well, Doctor Center Brown. That that in conceptually and in, intellectually, it, it makes a difference. I think that the intent is not to hurt anyone. Obviously, right. Unfortunately, when you hit someone with your with your car and you break their leg, if you're you're in the hospital and you with a broken leg, at that point, does it really make that much of a difference? Does it hurt less? because they didn't mean to hit you. You know what I mean? Right. right. And so I think that's kind of the, the tricky part because um, it's supposed to be a marriage. You know, we're supposed to be a team. I mean, you know, in addition to, to uh, the way my brain is wired, I wasn't, all, I wasn't, I wasn't brought up with the most, uh, I wasn't brought up to be a very social kid in general. You know, I was like, I was alone a lot. Mm-hmm. I was very self-sufficient. So, so that creates a lot of challenges, I think. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's staggering something. I just, I just, sorry, I just had a thought. It's like the the DMN, right? That doesn't shut off because I just realized that the other day I actually told her that, you know, she's the most important thing or thing. She's the most important person in my life. Like even every painting I've ever done, she's the first one to see it. Every sketch I've ever done. She's always the first one or everything that ever happened to me in the last 15 years. She's always the first person I tell. Mm -hmm. And I told her that. And she said, oh, I didn't know. You know, and that's when I realized like, oh my God, how, how, how is this possible? You know? And I think if both of you are being open and curious to learning these things, I think these are all like learnable things. Right. Right. It's just when you're, when you're in this process of discovery, sometimes you stir up some, some shit that, right. you know, is, is like, oh, well we got to, how do we got to deal with this now? Right. And, but you know, it's otherwise you keep sweeping shit under the rug and then you get a really lumpy rug. Right. Right. Yeah. For sure. And also, I mean, you know, and again, you know, part of the challenge is that anything that's, for me at least, you know, anything that has to do with emotional, I don't don't know what you want to call that. Is there a word for... Emotional regulation? No, like what's the noun for things that are emotional, like emotionally uh, charged conversation? Yes. I tend to um, not check out, but it's it's almost like you have this defense mechanism of like, uh oh, you know, this is, this can't be good. So let's just let's let's not because in the past, I have lost my jacket and don't know where my keys are and forgotten to call that person back and not, you know, paid the bill in time and I haven't, you know, I have done all these mistakes. So over time, you just go, oh, this this can't be good, 
you know, and that's when you tend to tune out. Oh, it's funny. Ye- yesterday or for the last two days, I, I thought I had lost my glasses. Right. <laughs> and uh, it's just not something I typically lose. I, I right. really only wear my glasses that I'm not, you know, but I have recently bought a new pair of glasses. I have needed a new pair for probably at least five years. Like my, my other glasses were so like such a bad shape. Like they were probably better off not even wearing them. And so I went to this place by my house. Um, it was a little bit more of a costly place that I, that I had never gone before. And I got these really, really nice glasses. Like, I spent like 600 bucks on these glasses. Like, I never had spent that kind of money on glasses before. Right. I've had them for two months. And I, like, thought for sure that I lost it. I just had that, like, <laughs> right. sick feeling in my stomach of just right, like, right. God, I'm just like, retracing my steps. Right. And um, it wasn't the first place that I looked. Right. Of course. I found oh, that's when you. That's when I, at least, I feel like a kid again. You know, when you're like, where's the jacket? You just mm-hmm. got the jacket. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, where's the bicycle? You know, you, you left with a bicycle. You came back without a bike, you know. <laughs> and, you know, it continues to this day because I remember I went to a racetrack with my car on the trailer without lug nuts. So that those are the little things that keep the wheels on the car. Oh, that's probably important. <laughs> <laughs> and so you think it's not like this isn't important to me, you know. Yeah, um, oh, Totally. Totally. <laughs> and yes. wheels on the car is pretty basic. <laughs> um, so, you know, but it's just, you know, that's just how, how the, unfortunately, how our minds work. But then at the same time, you know, that's why I kind of, you asked me, you know, like, what is, what's the title? Sometimes the superpower doesn't work for everything. Yeah. But in my particular case, it does help with the painting. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's I think end it there. Um, Nicholas Hunziker, uh, tell us the website one more time. It's basically my name. It's N I C O L A S H U N Z I K E R dot com. Or you can also go to shop Hunziker, which is S H O P H U N Z I K E R dot com. It's amazing. I sound like I can't spell. It's my own name. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you can uh, look at the show notes and get links to all of that. Nicholas, thank you so much for for coming on and uh, I wish you a continued success and learning and growth in everything that you are doing. And, uh, and yeah, Can I out. just say something though? Of just, course. Um, I, I want to thank you actually because um, your show has helped me a lot because, you know, when I started doing research, looking into the show, I mean, sorry, into the show, looking into ADHD, lots of it was just completely foreign to me, you know, because I, I didn't even know, really know it existed as a concept. I mean, not just, you know, ADHD, but, you know, things like mindfulness or, or, or just the fact that you can work on it or what, you know, what it is. And so um, between your show and the, the Attitude, you know, the Attitude magazine and their podcast, mm-hmm. um, I, I listened to them. And again, you know, I, I wish I could say every show I listened to, um, everything helped me 100 percent. That's not really the case. But every time I listen to it, I pick up a little point here and there, just like like a little hack where you go, oh, you know what? Maybe yeah. I should just, you know, and you try to incorporate this in your life. So I, I think it's great what you're doing. And I hope that, you know, if there's just, if I could contribute a little bit to that, maybe it'll help someone else. So oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Nicholas. But, but thank you. Thank you for what you do. I think it's awesome. Oh, thanks for saying that. I, I appreciate that. All right, it's Nicholas Hunziker. Go check out his website, his art, and uh, and all that. So uh, we will catch y'all next time. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening, and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks 
like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator Jim Dale is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things and we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.